Good morning, everyone. Very happy Easter to all of you. I am so excited that you're able to be here with us today. You know, there's a lot of things happening at the church, and uh, normally we would do this time as announcement time, but there's something a little bit more pressing that we need to discuss. You see, early on that first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started running to the tomb. Both were running, and the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. This is, by the way, John who wrote this, and he was pretty excited that he was faster than Peter. (laughs) He bent over and looked in, and the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple had reached the tomb first. They also went inside, and he saw, and he believed. They still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and she she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was him. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And at that, she turned and she, she turned towards him, and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers, and tell them, I am returning to my Father. And your father, to my God, to your God. And so she went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them everything and all the things that had happened to her. 
That's why we're here this morning, to celebrate the risen Lord. Our job, too, is to go and tell our brothers and sisters to tell everyone what we have seen and what we have heard. And today, we are going to do that very thing. So would you please stand with me? And we are going to pray and begin this proclamation. Lord, we, too, are gathered at the empty tomb. We, too, are witness that there is no one there. And today, Lord, above all days, we are here to celebrate the resurrection. Lord, each and every one of us are here today because of you. You have called to each of us. And Lord, I pray that this morning as we sing, as we study, as we pray, as we relate to one another, even as we have cups of coffee, Lord, we are doing all of this in your name for your glory. May today be a special blessing to you. And may today be a time where we gather together in your name and your name alone. For you have risen. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.
uh, this song is about uh, <clears throat> a guy named Simon who was in the crowd when uh, Jesus was carrying his cross. And it's a song about him. Walking on the road to Jerusalem The time had come to sacrifice again My two small sons, they walked beside me on the road The reason they came was to watch the Lamb Daddy, Daddy, what will we see there? There's so much that we don't understand. And so I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. Then I said, dear children, watch the land. There will be so many in Jerusalem today. We must be sure the land doesn't run away. So then I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. Then I said, dear children, watch the land. When we reached the city, I knew something must be wrong. There were no joyful worshipers, no joyful worship songs. I stood there with my children in the midst of angry men until I heard a crowd cry out. down upon his back the crowd began to yell in that moment I felt such agony in that moment I felt such loss until a Roman soldier grabbed my arm and screamed you carry his cross I tried to resist him Then his hand reached for his sword And so I knelt and took The cross from the Lord 
Place it on my shoulder and started down the street. The blood that he'd been shedding was running down my cheek. They led us to Golgotha. They drove nails through his feet and hands. And yet upon the cross I heard him pray, Father, forgive them. Oh, never have I seen such love in any other eyes. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. He prayed and then he died. I stood for what seemed like years. I'd lost all sense of time. Until I felt two tiny hands holding tight to mine. My children stood there weeping. And I heard the oldest say, Father, please forgive us. The lamb ran away. Daddy, Daddy, what have we seen here? There's so much that we don't understand. So I took them in my arms And we turned and faced the cross Then I said, dear children Watch the land easier if I move over, Kevin? <laughs> I didn't tell Kevin where I was going to stand. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hope everyone's having a good Easter so far. Uh, so I'm, my name's Rob. I'm going to uh, lead us in communion today, prepare us. And uh, I see that uh, I'm on the same page as uh, whoever put up the, uh, the banner over there. Because uh, the devotion I found by uh, Greg Laurie is called, It is Finished. So uh, from John 19, 28 to 30, uh, Jesus is on the cross, and uh, he's about to give up his spirit, and, he, and this is what happens. It says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So the cross was, a, was the goal of Jesus from the very beginning. His birth was so that there would be his death. The incarnation was for our atonement. He was born to die so that we might live. And when he had accomplished the purpose he had come to fulfill, he summed it up with a single word, finished. In the original Greek, it was a common word. Jesus probably used it after he finished a project that he and Joseph might have been working on together in the carpentry shop. Jesus might have turned to Joseph and said, finished, now let's go have lunch. It is finished, mission accomplished, it is done, it is made an end of. So what was finished? Finished and completed were the horrendous sufferings of Christ. Never again would he experience pain at the hand of wicked men. Never again would he have to bear the sins of the world. Never again would he, even for a moment, be forsaken by God. That was completed. That was taken care of. Also finished was Satan's stronghold on humanity. Jesus came to deal a decisive blow against the devil and his demons at the cross of Calvary. Hebrews 2.14 says, Only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death. This means that you no longer have to be under the power of sin. 
because of Jesus' accomplishment at the cross, finished was the stronghold of Satan on humanity. And lastly, finished was our salvation. It is completed. It is done. All of our sins were transferred to Jesus when he hung on the cross. His righteousness was transferred to our account. So Jesus cried out the words, It is finished. It was God's deliberate and well-thought-out plan. It is finished, so rejoice. Let's go to his table this Easter Sunday to celebrate the finished work of the cross. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you that um, you loved us so much that you sent your Son and that his love kept him on that cross until his sacrifice for our sin was finished. And it didn't end there, Lord, because today we celebrate that he may have died on Friday, but on Sunday, the tomb is empty. You resurrected him with your power, and that power overcame death and sin. We, uh, we thank you for these emblems that we're about to take. We, uh, we remember that the, the bread represents your, your body that was broken for us, and the fruit of the vine, Lord, which represents his blood that was shed for our sins. We ask a, a blessing on everyone here today that is about to take of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So when Jesus was in the upper room, he took the bread, broke it, passed it to his disciples, said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Meet this in remembrance of him. Likewise, he took the cup and said, This represents my blood that was shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's drink this in remembrance of him. We have uh, an awful lot of people to be praying for. Um, I was given a note this week that uh, Jim Nye has found himself in the hospital uh, down in uh, Hamilton now in the general. Uh, so we're going to be adding him to our prayer list. And uh, we're also adding Sharon Hoover to our prayer list. She's been in the hospital in Simcoe all week long uh, with a problem with her heart. It seems to be elevated and it's beating too fast. And they can't get that under control. And she's been there for quite a few days now. Uh, so we'll be praying for her as well. So if you'd please go to the Lord in prayer with me. <laughs> Lord, once again, we come before you. And Lord, we are simply astounded by who you are and what you have done. Lord, you have asked us to bring all of our prayers and petitions to you and to continue to do this without ceasing. Sometimes, Father, it feels like we're just repeating ourselves over and over, but this is something that you've put in place for us to do. And so, Father, we continue to bring these people to you and to your attention. We want to give praise, and we want to thank you so much for the healing that we've seen in so many's lives, for the miracles that you bring time after time. We thank you for Carol Elkner for bringing her back home to Leisure Living. And, Lord, we just pray that you continue to, to bless her. And, Lord, we thank you for the things that you have done in her life. Lord, we're, we're thank, so thankful for Larry Cowan that he's doing well and he's here this morning. And God, we just thank you for the healing that we see in him. And Father, we pray that you continue to do that. But Lord, we want to pray for, for Sharon Hoover. Lord, she's spent so much time in the hospital over the last year. And there's so many mysteries going on as to, to her health. So Father, I just pray that your healing hand may be upon her. May she return home soon. Lord, give her hope and strength. And Father, we just ask that you, you bring about all these things quickly. Lord, we still are praying and so thankful for Burl Downey and Al Fleming who are here this morning. And we thank you so much for 
for bringing healing to them. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to work on them. We pray that you continue to surround them and put your healing hand upon them. Lord, we're praying for Kyle Chupp, who is in need of some miracles in his life, Father. And Lord, he is back home again. And Lord, just waiting further treatments for his cancer. So Father, we just ask that you, you bless him and heal him. We thank you for the, the change that we've seen in Chase Potter. Lord, we just pray that you continue to do miracles in this young man's life. And Lord, return him to health. Lord, we pray for the, the health concerns of so many, of Marie Richardson, Dorothy Cotter, of Wade Bradley, Lois Helka. Lord, we're also praying for Jim Nye, who's in the hospital. Lord, each and every one of these people has different needs, and we're just asking that you bless them, give them hope. Lord, we pray that people are turning to you for the, in their times of need. Father, we also want to pray for the, the Johnson family, that pastor's family out of Simcoe. Lord, Luke has been fighting cancer for a long time this past year. And he's only seven years old, Father. And we have exhausted all of our medical abilities with him. And so, Father, we're just asking for a miracle in this young man's life. For the sake of that family, Lord, I just pray that you, you do something powerful and mighty. And, Lord, we just ask for healing for him. Lord, each and every one of us that are here this morning have something that we need. Each and every one of us here this morning have something that we're celebrating, something that we're in love with, someone that we're in love with. God, each and every one of us have concerns, some of them that we've admitted to each other, some of them that we haven't. And Lord, we all come here this morning with those things heavy on our hearts. And so, Father, we just offer these, these prayers to you. We put them on the altar and we give them to you because we can't do anything with them. And so, Lord, I just ask that you hear our prayers. Speak to us, Father. Finally, Lord, we are about to open your word and learn about your son. And I just ask that we listen as you speak to us. Help us to read well. Help us to ask good questions of you and of us. And Lord, draw close to us as we draw close to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, Easter. Easter is upon us. It is so wonderful to have a, a large group of people here, and so many people are traveling. Some people even managed to get away this Easter uh, to go off to far and exotic places. Um, a friend of mine, his name is Dave, his wife was invited to go out to Europe with some of her girlfriends. And when she left, she decided to give Dave a, a long list of things. You know, wives, you, you do this. And, and we, we actually kind of appreciate it, because for once, it's clear exactly what you want. All right? And so he had this long list of things that, had, <clears throat> that he needed to take care of, one of which was the family cat. Uh, one of those weird cats, you know, not just a normal cat that can kind of take care of itself. It's one of those cats that needs that very expensive food out of the weird dish and had to be given at certain times of the day, like all that stuff. And so she left this long list, and, and the cat was, was a, a priority on there. You know, go visit mom. That was a priority that was on there. Uh, take care of that window in the back that, that is still stuck that we haven't gotten unstuck, all that kind of thing. Well, she arrived in Heathrow, and she gave him a call, um, and that was great, and they were kind of talking back and forth, and eventually uh, they got to the point where they were talking about the list, and she said, well, well, how's the cat? And Dave, unfortunately, had to tell her, the cat's dead. I mean, he just, he just came out and blurted it out to her. Now, she's there on vacation, and she went, honey, are you kidding me? You, you tell me this now? You've ruined my whole trip. He was like, well, I'm sorry. I, I thought you'd want to know. And she's like, well, you could have let me down easy. When I was here, you could have told me that, that, I don't know, that the cat was up on the roof. And then when I call you when I get to Paris, you could have told me that, that it was being a little sluggish. And then when I, when I got back to London, that's when you could have told me that you think the cat might be sick. And then when I arrived in Toronto, that's the time. That's when you should have told me that the cat was dead. I was like, I... Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ruin your whole trip. She's like, well, well, how's mom doing? And he sat there for a moment and thought, and he said, she's on the roof. <laughs> the truth is hard, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, all of us, we say that we want the truth, right? But sometimes we have trouble when it comes to the actual truth. We have trouble 
saying it. We have trouble hearing it. We have trouble accepting it. This day and age, truth is something that's very, very important to us. And yet, we're all okay with some version of the truth, right? Like, if you watch a gum commercial, all that you need to be young and exciting is to chew a piece of gum, apparently. Right? Or, or I love Jeep commercials. Now, some of you actually own Jeeps and know a little bit more about this than I do. But, you know, apparently, if you want to scale the side of a mountain and climb rocks, all you need is a Jeep. And you can just do it, like, 90 degrees. <coughs> it's a really incredible thing. Truth, right? I knew that we were going to have a, a pretty good crowd here today. Easter is always a great crowd, and, and Christmas is always a great crowd. So preachers kind of count on those things. And there is a temptation when there's going to be a great big crowd to say something that the crowd is really going to be happy with. Like, you're all getting a free car, right? Like, that would, that would be fantastic. And it would make everybody excited. Trouble is, truth, truth matters, and truth matters even to big crowds. Now, we're here on Easter Sunday, and we've already read some of the scripture. The, the disciples, they, they didn't understand the truth. They, they were confused even. And some of them didn't even believe when the women came back and said, Hey, Jesus has risen from the dead. And they're like, Well, where is he? If he's risen from the dead, why isn't he standing right here? And sure enough, a little bit later, Jesus appears to them, and they understand the truth. But even when it gets a little bit later in the story, we get to the end of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus tells them the most important thing that he's ever going to tell them. He tells them that they're going to go into the whole world and preach and teach and baptize and all that stuff. And it says right there in Matthew 28, while they're worshiping at the feet of the resurrected Jesus, that some of them still doubted that the truth was hard for them to hear. Well, I want to tell you a story this morning that Jesus shared with a crowd. You see, there's this great big crowd that came out to see Jesus. This is long before the resurrection happened. This is early on in the ministry of Jesus. And this great big crowd came with all kinds of expectations of what they were going to hear Jesus preach about. You came here this morning expecting me to probably talk about the resurrection a little bit. There's some expectations that are in the crowd. And I'm going to do something that Jesus did. I'm going to tell the crowd the truth. This is in Luke chapter 8. So if you have your Bible, I want you to grab it. If, you, if there's a Bible sitting in front of you, I want you to grab it. Luke chapter 8. This great big crowd arrives, and Jesus begins like this in verse 5. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and he was scattering the seed, and some of it fell along the path. It was trampled on. The birds ate it up. Some fell on the rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell amongst the thorns, which grew up with it and choked out the plants. Still other seed fell on the good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears, let them hear. And then he stopped. This giant crowd comes out to hear Jesus, to see something amazing, to just witness what Jesus is going to tell them. They all have expectations of what they're going to hear and what they're going to do. This great big crowd, and Jesus tells a story about a farmer sowing seeds and then ends it and leaves. And the crowd is sitting there going, I mean, I, I appreciate a short sermon, but whew, that was short. And everybody's actually asking each other, what is, what is he talking about? What is he going on about? And even the disciples are going, wait a second. Jesus, what are you talking about? Why that? Why a story about dirt? And being Easter Sunday, I think it's important for us to ask a similar question. Why a story about dirt? Now, if you've been with us any amount of time, I've actually been preaching here at this church for over nine years at this point. This is a particularly favorite story of mine, and you may have heard it several times, but that's okay. Because sometimes we need the truth echoed to us time and time again. The disciples certainly did. They asked this question, what is going on? So Jesus, Jesus actually tells them a little bit of this truth. Now, Sometimes when the truth is told to us, we want to hear it. We're ready for it. We're prepped for it. Other times when the truth is told to us, we don't want to hear it at all. 
In fact, we will go out of our way to avoid the truth. You see, one of my favorite foods in the whole world is cured meats. It almost doesn't matter which one we're talking about at this point. It could be pepperoni. It could be all the way up to, to, to like pastrami. It could, be, it could be any of those meats. It's anywhere in between. I love all of them. And I love to pretend that those white things that are in those meats are vitamins. <laughs> right? Because I, I, love, I love the texture of it. I love the taste of it. I love the saltiness of it. I need a napkin as I'm talking about it. <laughs> I even, I even kind of like that orange stuff that comes out of it when you cook it. <laughs> Here's the thing. I don't want to know what's in it. I don't care. I don't need the truth about that because I like it that much. I don't want to know the truth. I don't want to know if it's beef or pork or some unholy combination of the two. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter if it's made in a factory or in a butcher shop or by some Hungarian woman somewhere. I don't care. I'm going to eat it because I like it. I don't need that truth. Unfortunately. That's how we treat an awful lot of information that we don't like, isn't it? Well, I don't need to know about that. I've been smoking for years. I don't need to know what it does to me. I don't need to know what's in that ice cream. I don't need to know what's around that corner. I don't need to know what my car is doing underneath the hood. Doctor, I don't need to know whatever it is you're about to tell me. We treat a lot of truth that way. The disciples are saying, okay... What's going on here? What are you talking about? Why would you tell this story about dirt to a giant crowd of people? Don't you know that that crowd needed to hear something uplifting? Don't you know that that crowd needed to hear something about, about salvation and all that stuff? And this is what Jesus' response was. Luke 8, verse 9. His disciples said, okay, well, what does the parable mean? He says this. The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you. He's speaking specifically to the disciples here. But to others, I speak in parables so that though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. You know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, guys, not everyone makes it. Not everyone's going to get it. Not everybody wants to get it. See, when you come in a great big crowd to Jesus, there's everybody likes crowds because there's safety in crowds, right? If you're just following along with the crowd, you're not really responsible for any of the happenings that go on because there's a crowd there. If a giant mob forms and runs through this town and ransacks the whole place and burns my lawn and smashes my windows and like steals all this stuff out of Bruce's store and does all that, right? Who's really responsible? There's a giant crowd. When the giant crowd is there in front of Jesus, the giant crowd expects that the giant crowd is going to be lifted up. And Jesus is saying, I don't really care for crowds. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for followers. I'm looking for disciples. I'm looking for people who are going to listen to what I have to say. And he says to the disciples, I'm telling the, the crowds this so that the crowds will be whittled down a little bit. Jesus knew what the people wanted. He knew that they wanted to be impressed. He knew what they wanted from him, and he wasn't going to play that game. Verse 11. This is the meaning of the parable, he says. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Now, it's important to understand here. It's important to understand here that what he's talking about is the stuff that just bounces, right? If you've ever taken a seed and you've thrown it down on a piece of cement, like you're out trying to replant the grass where your dog has torn up the, the lawn entirely and continues to dig there for some reason, you can't get them to stop, purely hypothetical situation. And you're throwing seed down on it, right? There's that, there's that hard patch. There's that place that's all rock that you throw the seed on. It doesn't matter how many seeds you throw down on there. It's not going to stick. It's not going to go in. It's just going to ricochet right off. This is, this is those people. The word of God doesn't matter to them. One bit, one iota. They don't care. 
They don't want to hear. And if you walk up to someone who's got their fingers in their ears like this and going, blah, 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 I've got kids, I can tell you, nothing is going to get through to them until they stop it. These people, the word of God just bounces right off. The rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. Who doesn't like to hear your sins are forgiven? Who doesn't like to hear the Easter message? But it has no root. You see, they believe it for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Because you see, the word of God goes in, and there's something that's supposed to happen there, and you're supposed to do something with it. You're supposed to move with it and listen and all those things. And it's easy to get that first part. That's the, that's the simplest part. In fact, in the book of James, we find out that demons even believe that there is a God. It's what you do with that that matters. And these people fall away. The seed that fell amongst the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked out by life's worries, by the riches and the pleasures. And look at how, what he describes these people as. They do not mature. It's great if you come to church. I love it. In fact, looking out on a Sunday morning, especially a Sunday like this when most of the seats are full, that is exciting beyond all measure. It is wonderful that you are here. But are you just coming to church? Are you maturing in the faith? But the seed on the good soil, the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word and retain it and by persevering produce a crop. You see, the word of God grows in these people. It changes them. It moves them. It, it interacts with their life. It actually does something. These are the people that Jesus are looking for. There are different reactions to Jesus' words. He told the crowd the short story, not because he wanted the entire crowd, but because he wanted individuals in the crowd. Some of them wanted to have Jesus as part of their life, for real. Some of them wanted to be there because their mom brought them and there was, they promised dinner later on. Some of them were only there because they saw the crowd going and they just followed along saying, I wonder what's going on today. Some of them were there because they wanted, they wanted something else entirely. Jesus says, not everyone in this crowd is going to make it. Now, I'm not saying that about you. I'm saying what Jesus said about that crowd. My true followers are the ones that will persevere with the truth, Jesus says. They will believe me even if they don't like what it is that I'm going to say. They will grow and produce a crop in their lives. He says it another way in John chapter 8. He says this, To the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Sometimes the truth isn't any fun at all right? But it's liberating. A long time ago, again, I don't see any young, young, young people here, but there once was a time when all of our videos weren't on a little device. And before that time, in the golden age, you went to this place that was called Blockbuster. <laughs> and you would walk in with your friends and you would go and you would physically pick up a thing and you would hold it in your hands and you'd turn it over and you would read on the back what it was and you would just take a chance and pay money for it and go and watch it. And then if you were too long taking it back, we would make you pay more money, even if you didn't like it. It was quite the system. It was perfect. And I was an employee of Blockbuster and I enjoyed my job a lot. And I was only 19 years old and I had this manager who was awful. She was just absolutely the worst. She loved the minuscule amount of power that she had, and she lorded it over people. And she really particularly hated men. Maybe you've met one of these ladies before, but she really didn't like me simply because of who I was. And so she would bring me into my performance reviews, and yes, the employees of Blockbuster actually had performance reviews. 
And she would go through this binder full of stuff that she was supposed to talk to me about. And one of the things that she had to judge me on was something called business acumen. I was 19 years old. I didn't know what in the world she was talking about, business acumen. And I would ask her, what does business acumen mean? And she said literally this. She said, if you don't know, I am not allowed to tell you. <laughs> Great managing style. And so a lot of what my raise would be based on, of what my performance was based on, was based on this acumen. And I didn't know what any of that meant. And back in those days... In the weary days when we lit the fire and we stood and warmed ourselves, <laughs> you couldn't just ask a question into a machine. You actually had to go and find a book and open the book and ask the book what the thing was. And I didn't want to look up what business acumen meant because I frankly didn't own a dictionary, right? And so I didn't know and so I wasn't going to go look. And so I constantly feared those times because I didn't know what it meant and I didn't know what I was being judged on. Eventually, she got fired, and we got a new manager, and that manager was actually pretty good. And we sat down for my first performance review, and I said, what in the world does business acumen mean? And he said, oh, that's simple. It means how well are you doing the things that the company has asked you to do? How well are you relating to customers, and how well are you bringing them into our system? That's what it means. And I said, oh, I'm terrible at that. <laughs> Right? It didn't change how I was being judged. However, it was liberating because I finally knew the truth. The truth is always like that. Sometimes it's great news. Sometimes it's wonderful. The truth is you actually did win a car. You didn't actually win a car. The truth is this or that. Sometimes you go to the doctor, you find out the truth, and you're like, okay, that's terrible. But now I know what to do. You see, when something is named, when something is, is brought in front of us and we finally understand what it is that we're dealing with, we can be free because we know what to do. Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Ladies and gentlemen, what is, this is the, the most difficult question I'm going to ask this morning, okay? Who is the truth? Jesus. Sometimes those Sunday school answers are the right answer. Jesus is the truth. He says, you shall know who? You shall know me, and I will set you free. What did he tell his disciples just a few minutes ago? He said, if you obey my commands, if you stay with the things that I have taught, if you stay amongst those, you will know me, and I will know you. You will be my disciples. If you know the truth, they will set you free. But, but aren't the rules... Aren't the rules of God so limiting? I, I can't do the thing that I want to do. I can't, I, can't, I can't have it. I can't do it. I, I, Jesus says, know me. Know the truth. It will set you free. So let me ask you this question. Do you really want to know the truth about Jesus? See, I imagine after this, this story, this story about dirt, and the explanation that he's given that, hey, some people that call themselves disciples aren't really my disciple. Some of the people that hear these words, it's just going to ricochet right off them and the devil's going to snatch them up. Some of the people that, that actually take it and take it with joy and are really excited to be with church people and be with Jesus and, and do all this stuff. Some of those people, when life gets in the way, they're just going to give up. And I'm sure the disciples listening to this are looking amongst themselves and, are you talking about me? Right? Because who amongst us, after reading that passage, didn't immediately, immediately slot yourself in there somewhere? And if we're really being honest, how many of us looked at that passage and said, I'm not the guy with the good soil? Right? Because we often, we often look at ourselves and think the absolute worst about ourselves. Every single one of us do that. And if you don't, you're lying. We do it all the time. And so Jesus doesn't leave them in that, that mental state of, uh-oh, I think I'm the worst. He continues on with this, Luke 8, verse 16. If you've learned the truth, he says, no one lights a lamp and hides it under a clay jar 
or puts it under a bed. Let's, let's pause there for a second. None of us light lamps like this any longer. None of us use clay jars to cover them over. So let's think about this in a modern context. When you walk into your dark house, nobody turns on a light and then unscrews the light bulb. Right? Unless you're Dutch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had an experience this week with some, a dark house and I thought it was really funny. No one lights a light and then unscrews the light bulb. Nobody does that. Instead, you leave the light on. Instead, you, you make sure that all the light bulbs that are in your light fixture are screwed in tightly, right? Why? Because nobody wants to bang their knee when they walk into the house. Nobody wants to trip over the dog. Nobody wants to trip over the stairs. Nobody wants to fall down. When you're out in the middle of the night and it is completely dark, and you can't see a thing. Is anybody comfortable walking around a space that you don't know? No, of course not. I was listening to a friend of mine here who's on the fire department, and he was telling me about some of the training that they have to do. And they put you into a complete sensory deprivation moment where they cover your eyes, they cover your ears, they cover everything so that you can't see, you can't smell, you can't hear anything. And all you have to go with is a hose and move along a hose in an environment that you're unfamiliar with. Does that sound like fun to anybody? No. What do you want in that moment? You want light. No, if you have the light, you put it on so that those who come in can see the light. And listen to this. This is a moment of truth. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed. Just let that sink in for just a moment. There is nothing hidden. Nothing. All of our thoughts, all of our feelings, the things that you do when you think nobody's looking, the things that you, you did a long time ago that you're afraid of, uh, anything, whatever it is, all of those secrets, all of those things that we think are private and to ourselves, there is nothing that is hidden that will not be disclosed to whom? To God. Because he sees them. He knows them. And I want you to think about this. If you're, if you're feeling uncomfortable about that, and you're tightening right up, and you're saying, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to deal with this. Jesus is still calling to you anyway. There is nothing concealed that will not be known and brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. And whoever does not have, even what they think they have will be taken from them. Not everybody's going to make it. I can't tell you how many people I've met that said, if there is a God, I'm going to go before him, and I'm going to stand confidently and say, I believed this and I believed that, and you're just going to have to deal with it, God. They don't phrase it like that, but that's what they're saying. And even what they have, what they think they have, will be taken from them. Jesus says, consider carefully how you listen. This may feel like a really heavy thing, and this may feel like a really dire warning, and boy, Easter Sunday, we weren't supposed to come and have, have this kind of moment, right? But understand this truth. He says, if you are my disciples, then be my disciples. That's what Jesus is saying. What's more? He says, if you have if you have that word that is in you, if it's planted down in there and, and it's being worked through and you're actually doing something with it, if you have, you are going to be given more. Isn't that exciting? Sure, there's a negative side to this, but, but think about the upside. This is what's hard to understand about Jesus. You see, he doesn't ask us for just, just a little bit. Jesus doesn't ask us to just kind of show up and be nice to people a little and then good things will happen to us. That's not the message. Jesus went to that cross and he looked out at this crowd of angry sycophants who were angry for no reason, who got whipped up by a political system that made them super mad. And all these people didn't know what they were doing and that's what Jesus' prayer was, wasn't it? Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He looked out at a group of people who wanted to kill him and he died for their benefit. Jesus looks out upon us, and he knows us. He knows your name. 
He knows more than that. He knows where you've been or what you've done. It says that he has counted the hairs on your head and it didn't take long for me. But he knows us that intimately that not even one of them falls to the ground without his knowledge and permission. And he went to that cross for you. And then on that Sunday morning, he stands in front of us with his palms open wide to us and says, peace be with you. Come on. Did you hear it? The word of God is a seed that goes down into you. Jesus said it like this in Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven, what we just talked about right there, it's like a treasure being hidden in a field. When the man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went out and sold all that he had and bought the field. Do you know what that means? It means that it is so valuable, it is so good, that there is nothing else in life, in all of life, that compares to that. That's the truth. Sometimes we hear the truth and we don't want to listen to it. Sometimes we're near the truth and so we think that we've had it. You know, when I was growing up, my dad is a pastor, mom, pastor's wife, and daughter of a pastor, and you know, it's all in the family and all that stuff. I grew up around faith. Doesn't mean that I had it. I grew up near to faith. I borrowed the faith from my parents for the longest time. I borrowed the faith from all my Christian friends because I had all Christian friends. I borrowed the faith from my church family. Doesn't mean that it was mine. And you know what that bought me? Nothing. A lot of guilt. I knew the things that I was supposed to be doing, but down in here, where it mattered, down in the seat of my life, my heart, down where the Word of God is supposed to implant itself, it wasn't there. I knew the truth. I didn't accept the truth. And then one day, the worst happened to me. Then one day, I was numb and in pain. And I realized that on the inside, I could only describe myself one way as being dead. I didn't want to laugh. I didn't want to smile. I didn't want people around. I didn't know what to do because I hurt on the inside. And in, in Scripture, it tells us that those that are apart from Christ are dead in their sins. That's what that deadness feels like. And I thought the rest of my life was going to be like that. And I thought that all I had for the rest of my life was just to pretend to be okay. And to pretend to be okay with everyone and to pretend to be okay with God and pretend, pretend, pretend. And inside it was completely hollow. And then there was one day where Jesus spoke to me. You can believe it or not, I don't care. Because he spoke to me. And he said to me, this thing that you've made yourself, this thing that you believe about yourself, that's not what I think. And he said, do you want to be with me or do you want to continue to be that? I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know exactly what he was asking. But what I knew was what he was offering sounded so much better than what I could give myself. And so I said yes to him. By the way, I did this while driving on the road which I would not suggest you do. I burst into tears, and I can only imagine what the people that were driving around me thought as they witnessed this. <laughs> right? But here's what I can tell you. That word of God that is a seed that implants itself inside of you, there's nothing else like it. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I certainly did not believe that at some point in time I was going to be a pastor. It was something that I wanted to walk away from and something that God kept yanking me back to. I certainly did not believe that I was ever going to find the one woman of my dreams. I certainly did not believe that I was going to start a family. I certainly, certainly never believed that I was going to come to Selkirk to be a preacher. <laughs> Who knows what God is going to do with your life? I have been called into dangerous situations. I have been called to sit and sip tea with old ladies. 
I have been called to be friends with people that I would have never imagined I was going to be friends with. I have been called to go across the seas to do things for Christ that I can't even comprehend. And I've done all these things. And Jesus keeps asking to do more and more and more. And tomorrow, I have no idea what tomorrow is going to be. Maybe it's going to be boring and mundane. Maybe it will be the most exciting thing that's ever happened. But here's what I know. He has never left me. And I need him more today than I did yesterday. That's the Jesus I know. That's what the word of God is when it plants inside of you. And it is up It is up to each one of us to listen to the truth and allow that truth to set you free. So this Easter, you have an opportunity. I don't know if your family thing is coming up or it's already happened or if you're invited to one or you're going to go home and give yourself a cupcake. I don't know. But today at some point in time, you're going to be with someone else. You're going to be in a time where you can use the word of God to do something And I would encourage you to do it. Because here's the thing about dirt. It's not a static thing. Sure, yeah, there's rocky soil, and sure, there's a path, but you know what? You can get out a shovel, and you can stick it in there, and you can start mixing it around, right? You can pick the rocks out. You can be changed. You can be that good soil. And I pray and hope that you are. Let's go to the Lord. Lord, May we be good soil. God, you know the the areas of our life that needs changing. You know the parts of us that are hidden away from everybody else. You know the things that are in our future and the things that are in our past, and yet you have called to every single one of us anyway. Why? Because you love us. Father, may we accept that love. May we hear these words of yours. May we hear the truth, and may the truth set us free. May we be set free from our own inhibitions. May we be set free from our own failures. May we be set free from our disbelief. And Lord, may we follow you wherever you call us. For your word is good. Your desire for us is immense. And what is it that you said, Father? Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. That you have come that we may have life and have it abundantly. And that you're always with us. Thank you for those promises, Lord. May they be true in each and every one of us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
verse 8, it says this, For you were once in darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Let's do that today. Let's pray one more time. Lord, as we go from this place, may we live as children of the light. And Father, may we shine that light wherever it is. May we be that good soil that takes root deep within us, the word of the Lord. And Father, wherever we go, may your name be on our lips. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.